Stephanie Gaglardia is currently a PhD candidate in the Integrative Agroecology Lab at the University of Toronto in the Scarborough campus. She investigates sustainable and biodiverse agricultural ecosystems through an agroecological perspective. Her current focus research is on plant functional trait variability, soil nutrient and microbial dynamics, and plant interactions in multi-species cash crop farming systems in Central America. This webinar is going to be about farming operations characterized by heavy chemical inputs and monocrop fields, which are causing severe damage to ecosystems worldwide. The negative impacts of such practices has promoted renewed interest in sustainable agricultural systems, such as agroecology. Agroecological agri practices are characterized by on-farm biodiversity and the recycling of local natural materials which promotes the conservation and improves the quality of soil and water resources. Together, we will explore how this social and environmentally sustainable approach can feed our global economy. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to you, Stephanie Gallardi. Thank you for everyone that's listening in today for my talk about agroecology. Um, I'm first going to start off with an explanation of what agroecology is, as well as some context. I will discuss how different types of agroecological practices um, can benefit the environment, focusing on four key areas, um, habitat conservation, soil health, water quality, and resiliency to change. I will end my talk today with a brief discussion on what our food future can look like. And I encourage you to reflect on this question throughout my talk today. So before jumping in, I want to start off by thinking about what, what we just ate. So it most likely wasn't as lavish as this table setting here, uh, but our last meal likely had some vegetables maybe some meat, some cheese, uh, and probably some grain products. But have you ever thought about where your food comes from? Now, thinking beyond just your local grocery store, all of the food that we eat was grown in some way on some sort of farm. So when you think of a farm, you may imagine something that looks like this. So here's a photo of what I'm assuming to be a wheat field. And this is what an industrial farm might look like. Not all industrial farms look the same, but they generally have the following characteristics. So they are very large in size. Uh, they tend to be made up of monocultures. That's the practice of planting one type of crop in a field. So in this photo, there's only wheat growing for many, many acres. Uh, they tend to depend extensively on chemical fertilizers and synthetic pesticide applications, as well as other external energy inputs, such as the tractors you see in the photo, they need fossil fuels to run. Uh, industrial farms tend to depend on rapid technological innovations. So here you can think of genetically modified organisms. And from an economic perspective, they require large capital investments, and have a heavy dependency on agribusiness. Unfortunately, industrial agriculture has been linked to many negative environmental effects. So worldwide, we have seen significant soil degradation, such as soil erosion pictured in the top left photo. Waterways have been contaminated by things such as fertilizers, which can lead to toxic water such as the green water in the top right photo. Uh, that's water from the Gulf of Mexico, and it was contaminated with large amounts of fertilizers that led to algal blooms, which is why the water is green. Industrial agriculture, especially monoculture farming, as pictured in the bottom left, um, as well as the application of chemicals, has led to severe habitat loss, which reduces plant and insect biodiversity. So some of you may have heard of the bee colony collapse that we're currently causing. Uh, industrial agriculture or this uh, monoculture and chemicals can also make industrial farms more susceptible to pest invasions as well as climate change. There have also been 
negative health impacts found, for example, from chemical applications like fertilizers and pesticides. And some of these chemicals are widely used around the world, even though they've been found to be toxic to animals and insects and even potentially harmful to humans. So for example, Monsanto's Roundup, which is a very common herbicide that's used around the world, contains the chemical glyphosate as its main ingredient, and it's been linked to cancer as well as other uh, very serious health concerns. So while you may have initially pictured a farm like this, what if I told you that a farm could also look something like this? So this is a photo of uh, a coffee farm in Central America. And you can see that there are flowers growing, there are banana trees, there are also some pineapple plants scattered around, as well as some other herbs. And this is an example of what an agroecological farm can look like. But so are these. So again, you're seeing different plants growing. Uh, the photo on the right has beehives to promote the incorporation of pollinators. And the photo on the left, you can see some trees along the edge there. So although these farms are growing different things in different parts of the world, they're all considered agroecological. And these farms are often characterized by higher biodiversity and lower artificial inputs, which allows them to utilize natural ecological processes such as nutrient cycling, um, natural pest management, soil and water conservation, and carbon sequestration. And so agroecological farming has been linked to many environmental benefits, Let me see. there we go, um, such as healthy soils and clean water, greater resiliency to pests and disease, and even climate change. Um, and since agroecological practices are shaped from the bottom up, meaning that farmers themselves are developing the technologies and practices that they use on their farms, local farmer knowledge is recognized and the technologies that are used are accessible. So now you may be wondering what exactly the term agroecology means. And there's often been a lot of uncertainty around this term, or sometimes people have just never heard of it before. So I wanna give a clearer definition for what agroecology actually is. So to begin, um, it is a type of science. Uh, so this has to do more with a theoretical approach. So I myself am considered an agroecologist, and that is essentially because when I ask research questions about managed agricultural systems, I consider the land as an interacting ecosystem. And so I recognize the interaction between species, so between different types of plants, even animals and insects. And I also consider the social political aspects that are affecting that system. Agroecology is also a practice, and so that's what I've been describing so far. So there's essentially a set of principles that agroecological farmers follow. This is not limited to just organic farming, as an agroecological farm can be organic, but an organic farm may not necessarily be agroecological. So instead, to be considered as an agroecological farm, you would use ecology-based practices and technologies. Lastly, it is also a social political movement, the most popular being La Via Campesina, which essentially means the farmer's way in Spanish. According to their website, it is an international movement which coordinates peasant or farmer organizations of small and middle-scale producers agricultural workers, rural women, and indigenous communities from Asia, Africa, America, and Europe. So while agroecology is all of these different aspects, the focus for the rest of my talk today will be specifically about the practice of agroecology and its benefits to different aspects of the environment. 
So I've been mentioning agroecological practices a lot already, and I want to just describe some of them to you. One of the dominant features of agroecological farms is biodiversity. So this is combining different types of crop species, different varieties, or maybe even just different types of plants completely. Um, and pictured here is one such diverse farm, and we will call this a polyculture. So poly meaning many. And when you're looking at a farm like this, it looks a lot more like a natural ecosystem you would find rather than a typical monoculture that we see in industrial agriculture. Um, again, mono here is meaning one, reflecting the presence of only one type of crop. And it is because of this difference, so it's because of this biodiversity, that agroecological systems can be good for produ producing food, good for the environment, and good for the people working the land. Now there are different types of designs, we could call them, so different ways that you can arrange these biodiverse plants on your agroecological farm. And some of them are, for example, intercropping. So intercropping is where you have rows of one type of plant planted next to a row of a different type of plant. So pictured here on the left is corn planted among rows of soybeans. And this type of layout helps to add nutrients to the soil. But you can also have rows of flowers instead, like the photo on the right. And the flowers could act to attract pollinators to your farm. You can even plant trees between rows of crops. And that would act to prevent things such as erosion. And that would be a type of agroforestry system. So agroforestry meaning that there are trees planted among your crops. This photo here is taken in Central America. This is one of the farms that I study personally. Um, and you're seeing the trees growing above the coffee plants. And the coffee plants are the little shrubs that you can see. Uh, this farming system is beneficial to coffee plants because they prefer the climate that these shade trees create. But not all plants can thrive in such a shaded environment like this. So instead, trees can be incorporated along the edges of a cropping field, for example. Silvopasture is another type of agroforestry technique which is combining trees with pasture, which is land that's available for animals to graze. So pictured here are goats roaming around pine trees, eating a variety of grasses in the US. There's also something called crop rotations, where one year you plant a, feel, a field of a certain type of crop, and the next year you change it and you plant a different type of crop. So this is diversity not in space, but over time. So pictured here will be an example of a farm that rotates between wheat, then canola the next year, and then soybeans. This farming practice can help to conserve and even add nutrients into the soil, as well as reduce the persistence of pests and weeds. Another technique to add biodiversity to your farm is including cover crops, which is growing plants specifically so that the soil is not left bare. So they're specifically there just to cover the soil. When these plants die, they can be used in conservation tillage practices, which is essentially mixing dead plant material into the soil where they then act as a type of green manure, which is when dead plant material is left to decompose into the soil. So these methods act as a natural fertilization for the soil. So, so far I've been describing agroecological practices that increase the biodiversity of plants in food landscapes, but it's also important to consider how this biodiversity affects the biodiversity of other non-plant species. So think of this. If you have a landscape of only monocultures, so just one type of plant on acres of land, like in the monoculture on the left, and these plants are sprayed with chemicals, there's not a lot of safe food for animals and insects to eat. Instead, 
these animals and insects will move elsewhere or their populations will suffer and decline. When looking at a diversified agroecological system, as pictured on the right, you can clearly see that this diversified system has greater resources, different types of shelters and food that's available for different types of animals and insects, which contributes then to greater habitat conservation. And the animals and insects that need this habitat are important since many of them act as pollinators for us. So pollinators are animals and insects that move pollen from one part of a flower to another part or to another plant completely. And this allows the plant to then make fruits and vegetables and even seeds. So the biodiversity promoted by agroecological practices can attract important pollinators by providing diverse food sources. Like in the photo on the left, we can see tomato plants planted next to sunflowers. And these sunflowers are acting to attract the bees that are needed to pollinate the tomato flowers in order to create tomatoes. So by incorporating these flowers, you're able to attract pollinators to boost your farm yields. And you can also help to protect pollinators by giving them lots of food sources. Incorporating flowers does not only have to attract pollinators, you can also use them to attract other insects that help to control pests and disease, therefore minimizing the need to apply chemicals. So the photo on the left shows lettuce that is intercropped with a type of flower that is used specifically to attract surfid flies to the field. Now these surfid flies are needed to prey on aphids as aphids are a type of pest that harms lettuce. So including these flowers is a type of natural pest, pest management technique that is often found in agroecological farms. Now it's easy to look at all the beautiful plants growing above ground and think that the ecosystem is functioning well, but it's also important to look below ground at the soil environment because this is where plants are accessing important nutrients and water and where they're interacting with millions of other species to create a healthy and sustainable soil ecosystem. Unfortunately, certain industrial agricultural techniques can lead to soil degradation, which is simply a decline in the quality of the soil. And this can result in different poor soil characteristics such as compaction, erosion, salinization, acidification, and reduced soil organic matter. I'll briefly explain what some of these characteristics are and how they can come about and how different agroecological practices can prevent these scenarios and nurture our soils. So soil salinization occurs when salts accumulate in the soil to a level that negatively impacts plant growth. So you can see on the, in the image on the left, all that white stuff on the surface of the soil, that's actually salt. So you can see that there aren't many plants growing in that part of the field, similar to the image on the right of a wheat field that has also been affected by very salty or saline soils. So we can see that soil salinization leads to decreased plant growth and can eventually kill all of the plants growing in that soil, essentially creating a dead soil. Now salinization is caused by excessive irrigation. So when you have a, a farm in a dry climate, there is often an excessive use of water for irrigation. And this water naturally contains at least some salts. So after this water is evaporated or it's taken up by, by the plants, some of the salt is left behind. And so if there's not sufficient rainfall to wash these salts away, the salts can accumulate, which then leads to soil salinization. salinization. Soil compaction is essentially the compression of soil particles 
into a smaller volume. And this can be caused by the use of heavy machinery on fragile soils. So in the image on the left, you can see the tire marks left from a piece of machinery that pushed the soil down, which results in reduced air and water pockets in the soil, or reduced porosity as it's called. And this makes it harder for roots to move around in the soil and access nutrients. And even harder for water to just infiltrate into the soil, so harder for the water to just be absorbed into the soil. Um, compacted soil behaves similar to concrete sidewalks. So after a rainfall, the water isn't absorbed into the concrete. Instead, it's washed off into sewers or it forms petals. This is similar to what happens with compacted soils. So the water cannot be absorbed into the soil, so it can't infiltrate. And instead, it washes off the surface, which is called surface runoff. Or as pictured he here, it pools into big puddles and it just sits there. This compaction then leads to poor plant growth because there's no moisture actually in the soil and also because the plants just can't move around and they can't grow bigger. Soil erosion, when we're talking about agriculture, is when the top layer of soil of a field is removed and lost. So the image on the left shows what looks like a stream running through this farm, but it actually wasn't there intentionally. Instead, it was created by water traveling through the field, collecting soil along the way, and just washing it away. So erosion can also be caused by high winds blowing dry soil. Like the image on the far, on the far right, it's from Western Australia, which is typically very dry and you can see a massive cloud of soil just being blown away. This can be a major problem because the top layer of soil, so the part of the soil that's lost to erosion, is the most important part for agriculture because it contains the most nutrients needed for plant growth. And also because this layer of soil takes hundreds of years to form. Soil acidification occurs when soils become more acidic and then plants can't grow because they're not able to tolerate this acidic conditions. But to understand why this happens, we should first note that plants are naturally alkaline and soils are slightly acidic. So when after harvest, plant residues are completely taken off the land, so with the corn plant, we're talking about the roots, the stems and the leaves, everything that you don't eat. When this is all removed, as is normally done in industrial farming practices, their alkalinity is also removed, which then over time leads to the soil becoming more and more acidic. In contrast, when naturally alkaline plant material is left on the soil after harvest, they eventually decompose and then neutralize the acidity of the soil. Industrial agriculture can also lead to low amounts of soil organic matter. Now soil organic matter is a layer of soil that is composed of decomposing plants and animal residues. So it contains a lot of plant nutrients. It's normally identifiable by its really dark color, its lightweight, and it has a high soil moisture content. Similar to soil acidification, reduced soil, or, or soil organic matter often results from industrial agricultural practices because the plant material is removed from the soil, and so then there's nothing there to be decomposed into this nutrient-rich soil layer. Other industrial agricultural practices, such as heavy fertilization and tilling, can actually kill off the organisms that are responsible for decomposing plant materials and converting these dead plants into new nutrients. There are agroecological practices that can prevent many of the soil degradation processes I just described and can instead promote stable soils with good structure and infiltration, 
high soil organic matter, and healthy soil biota or soil organisms. For example, the agroecological practice of having diverse plant species also means that there are diverse roots in the soil. And this can help promote infiltration and reduce soil compaction, therefore improving the overall soil structure. So this image here gives a clear representation of how different plants have different root architectures. So by including plants that have different root structures, whether the roots are deeper, they go wider, or they just have a greater volume, you're essentially creating passageways or tunnels through the soil. So when those roots die and decompose, these passageways still exist for new roots to grow into, or even just for water to travel through. Incorporating cover crops, which again is the practice of growing plants on a field for the sole purpose of covering the soil, helps to improve the stability of the soil by protecting it from erosion. So it protects the soil from wind erosion by keeping the soil moist. And also the roots of these cover crops essentially hold the soil together and therefore can help prevent against water erosion. Conservation tillage, which again is essentially mixing dead plant material into the soil and also green manure, which is the practice of just letting that dead plant material decompose into the soil, can act to naturally replenish soil nutrients, increasing the soil organic matter, and improving the soil structure. So here we have soybeans planted next to corn plants. So corn is in the middle. And when this plant material dies, it will decompose, into soil organic matter and nutrients will eventually be released into the soil for new plants to then take up. Soybeans are actually a very special plant because they are nitrogen fixers. So that means that they are a special type of plant that can actually just pull nitrogen as a gas out of the air and with the help of special bacteria can change it into a form of nitrogen that plants use. So this is the same form of nitrogen that's applied in artificial chemical fertilizers. So soybeans are essentially natural fertilizing plants. So when plants like soybeans decompose into the soil, their plant material is especially rich in nutrients, adding even more nutrients to the soil for the rest of your crops for free. Improper agricultural management can also lead to reduced water quality and even toxic water. So eutrophication occurs when there is a large input of minerals and nutrients into a body of water. And while there can be many sources of uh, this input of nutrients and minerals, uh, it includes potentially large runoff from industrial farms that are applying excessive fertilizers or simply just applying them improperly. This causes a lot of plants and algae to grow in the water. And so then the water becomes cloudy and changes color. As you can see in the photos, the water has turned a reddish color or very bright, bright green, and that's not healthy. So with all of these plants growing in the water, they're taking up all the oxygen and they're reducing the amount that's available in the water and it essentially suffocates the fish and other life that exists in the water. So it essentially makes these bodies of water dead because not much else can live there. This contamination of waterways can happen through both surface and subsurface processes. So surface runoff which I described before as water running, rushing off of the surface, can carry soil and nutrients off of the farm and can end up in lakes and rivers, increasing the nutrient and sediment content in these bodies of water. Again, runoff is increased when the soil is compacted and also if the farm is on a steep slope. Leaching is a subsurface process 
And when water and dissolved nutrients, um, it happens when water and dissolved nutrients drain through and out of the soil. So if a farm applied a lot of fertilizer or applied fertilizer at the wrong time or to the wrong area, the plants aren't able to take up all of these nutrients. And instead, these excess nutrients eventually just drain out of the system through the soil and then end up in our water tables, our wells, rivers, and lakes. So this leaching of nutrients can both contaminate water, but it can also just encourage farmers to apply even more fertilizers. Certain agroecological practices such as biodiverse farming can enhance water use efficiency and therefore reduce the demand for water uh, by farms. So deep rooted plants like trees as pictured here can actually redistribute water in the soil. So these deep rooted trees pull water up for their own use because they need water too. And this water is then brought up closer to the surface by those strong roots pulling up the water. And this water is then available to more shallow rooted crops to use, like the corn in this image. This process is commonly referred to as the water pumping effect, which enhances the efficiency of water use and prevents the soils from drying out. Agroecological practices can also reduce the overall risk of water contamination by encouraging natural nutrient recycling rather than the application of artificial fertilizers. So again, we are seeing practices like cover cropping, conservation tillage, and green manure. So these practices reduce the need to apply artificial fertilizers and also promote infiltration which reduces nutrient runoff into nearby rivers and lakes. Also, different types of biodiverse farming can prevent nutrients from being lost from the system through nutrient leaching. So again, when fertilizers are, apply are applied excessively or at the wrong time, plants like the corn pictured here aren't able to take up all of these nutrients. So instead, these nutrients just drained through the soil and into our water. If, however, there are different types of plants with deep roots, like these trees, as would be found in an agroforestry system, these roots can intercept these nutrients and use them. Uh, so imagine these deep roots essentially pulling nutrients up from deep in the soil and then once the tree leaves fall or the plant residue is left on the ground after harvest, these nutrients are returned back to the soil through decomposition. So they are recycled again, making it a very nutrient efficient system. And what I just described is commonly referred to as the safety net effect, which prevents nutrients from being washed away off of our farms and then into our waters. This effect is one of the things that makes riparian buffers uh, effective. So riparian buffers are areas of plants such as trees and grasses that border a body of water. So in this photo, you can see two large agricultural fields with a meandering river passing through them. Most importantly, you can see that thick band of trees and other vegetation bordering the agricultural fields and the water. So this vegetation in the riparian buffer can serve to intercept nutrients that would otherwise just wash off from the farm and end up in the water. Therefore, they can greatly contribute to the conservation of our clean waters. We have all heard about how climate change is going to and already is greatly impacting the world that we live in. And one of the ways is going to be through agriculture. So this figure is, is from Klein's book called Global Warming and Agriculture in 2007. And it shows their predictions on how agriculture will change around the world up to 2080. And we can see that the green colors represent an increase in agricultural productivity and the red colors represent a decrease in productivity. 
So we can see that in Canada, they predict an increase in agricultural productivity between 10 and 25%. And this is likely based on uh, the expected increases in global temperatures. However, there are many parts of the world that may see a decrease in agricultural productivity, and this can be caused by excessive temperatures. But we also need to consider the impact of predicted severe droughts or flooding, more frequent and forceful storms, as well as how pests are going to affect increasingly sensitive agricultural lands. So how can agroecology help? Agroecology first can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions because they require less mechanization and less chemical inputs. So there's less of a need for fossil fuels. Agroecology can help to conserve and even recreate healthy soils, conserve our waters, and it can also reduce the effect of harmful pests and disease by such things as interrupting the pest life cycle, attracting natural pest predators and other ways. Certain agroecological practices can also moderate extreme climates. So in agroforestry, the shade trees can reduce the intensity of the sun and even promote soil moisture in drying climates. From an economic perspective, agroecology can make farms more resilient by diversifying crops and therefore diversifying incomes. Unfortunately, uh, industrial agriculture has often been portrayed as a solution to feed our growing global community. And in fact, there is a growing discussion now in the media about feeding our food future, our future population of about 10 billion people by 2050. And these discussions are often linked to the promotion of the further intensification of industrial agriculture which I think is perfectly pictured here in this image from the National Geographic website, where you can see large tractors driving over a massive expanse of monoculture fields with the dust and exhaust just blowing out in the wind. And presenting images like this or headlines like this can easily give the impression that we cannot produce enough food without following the principles of industrial agriculture. And I feel that there are at least two big problems with this line of thinking. First off, it ignores the fact that we already produce enough food to feed 10 billion people. And instead, people around the world are going hungry because of social political inequalities that affect the distribution of food and global food prices. Secondly, it ignores how unsustainable current industrial agricultural practices are so how are we supposed to feed our world population beyond just 2050 if we've degraded all of our soils, contaminated our waters, lost our biodiversity, and become more susceptible to plant disease outbreaks and climate change? Instead, many academic researchers, local farming groups, and even international agencies like the UN are calling for greater adoption of agroecological practices in order to feed our global community. So what can you do? We know that industrial agricultural practices can be detrimental to our environment and unsustainable for our food, for our food future. We also know that agroecological practices can help to improve biodiversity, soil health, water quality and agricultural resiliency, but what can you do? And I think that it all starts again in your plates. So be critical of where your food comes from. If you're able to buy your food locally, either directly from your local farmers or from your neighborhood farmers markets, talk to your farmers and learn what they're doing to ensure the sustainability of their food ecosystems. If your, you or your family buys your food from other food outlets like grocery stores, research how those food products are grown and seek out agricultural companies that follow principles that you agree with. Also just learn how to grow food. 
You can join a local food garden in your neighborhood or create one if it doesn't exist. Because growing food from scratch is a very rewarding experience and it can also teach you a lot about the delicate balances that exist in a food ecosystem. Most importantly though, you can reimagine what your food future can look like. And you can choose to place value on biodiversity and food ecosystems and recognize the importance of local farmer knowledges. I've included here a list of references that I used and also just a handful of other useful readings that you can explore and to help you learn more. And this is also a list of additional resources that you can access to learn more about agroecology and sustainable agriculture in general. And it even includes some groups that youth can join. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really good. Thanks. I really enjoyed that. Now, at this point, I'd like to go forth with the Q&A. Okay. And right now, we don't have any questions from any of the attendees. However, I myself have a few questions for you, Stephanie. So I'll just start with the questions that I have, and maybe if anybody has any questions after that, we can address them. So the first question I have for you is about the last slide that you just went through. Uh, you mentioned about being mindful about the food that we eat or that we buy. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point, but I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions as to aware or like what companies are sustainably getting their food and like if you have any recommendations. Um, I feel like an easy way to start is um, eco labels. So okay. I don't know how many of you guys drink coffee, but you might see Rainforest Alliance. Uh, that looks like, um, I think it looks like a green frog on, uh, on the label of the products that you're buying. Um, there are different eco labels like that. Um, which unfortunately some of them can also be misleading because you might think them to mean one thing, but they actually mean something else. So when you're buying packaged products like that, you can look out for these eco labels, educate yourself on what they mean, and then you could choose products like that. So for example, the Rainforest Alliance eco label um, encourages biodiversity on farms. Um, there are specifics to um, how farms can get that certification. And uh, there's also a discussion on the issues of the certification process. Um, but that's one thing that you can look out for when buying uh, products in grocery stores. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. What about like organic and non-GMO products? Um, so those are, that's a a whole other realm or a whole other discussion but um, in Canada we do have the organic um, certification I don't believe we we require um, products to label whether they're GMO or non-GMO um, but I, I, I've seen products that voluntarily note that they're non-GMO um, there is a discussion about um, the uh, and people are free to have their own opinions about the importance of these different issues mm -hmm. those are a little separate i would feel from strictly agroecology speaking okay. um but like i would encourage people to research you know what does it actually mean to be organic are they allowed to use chemicals at all or is it completely chemical free um, what does GMO actually mean and what are the concerns with it or what are the pros and cons? Um, and from my experience working on small organic farms, I found that certification doesn't mean everything. And that's when I would encourage people to, if, they're, if, if they can, to actually just talk to their farmers and see uh, what their farming practices are. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, another question for you from one of our attendees is, what role do native plants have in agroecology and how can farmers incorporate them or conserve them on their farms? So native plants are amazing. Um, because if you think about it, these are plants that have lived here all along. So they are able to survive in our climate, in our soils and, every, and uh, they are best adapted to growing here. So if you're able to, um, if a farm is able to produce local varieties um, of a certain crop, chances are that crop will do better than a variety that comes from another place in the world. Um, if you're thinking beyond just crop species, so native flowers, for example, or even native, uh, other native herbs, these native plant species are going to attract also native pollinators. So same way that plants have evolved here and are best uh, suited for our climates, um, these pollinators and other insects and animals also have evolved here, but they've evolved here eating and using native plant species. So the more native plants you have, you know, whether you have a, a farm or whether you just have a potted plant on your windowsill, you are giving food, the, the natural food that these insects and animals need to eat and that they've evolved to eat. So you're, you're helping them out a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question for you is, are many farmers making good choices when it comes to agroecology and how is the message of agroecology being shared among farmers? Um, I think it's very, it's very encouraging. So I've been to a couple um, conferences um, where local farmers within Canada uh, were able to come and share their experiences. And, and it was an interesting intermingling with farmers, academics, and uh, organizations. And so I heard a lot about um, efforts within communities um, even just between farmers, sharing their experiences, um, giving tips, um, and spreading their knowledge, um, I would say maybe a little bit more informally that way. One of the, I'm just going to go back on my slide here, one of the groups that I mentioned here, um, Food Secure Canada, like all these resources, they're also used um, to share knowledge not just with the general public, but also to farmers. So these are sources of knowledge for these farmers to figure out how they can change their practices uh, to be more, uh, just more sustainable in general. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I have one last question for you, mm -hmm. um, and it's regarding the agroforestry. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you've been studying that in South America. I'd like to know whereabouts in South America, and I'd also like to know if other places other than South America are practicing agroforestry. Yeah, so agroforestry is, um, I would, I would say, quite pop popular, and it's, it's quite easy to identify even. So I study specifically coffee agroforestry systems in uh, Costa Rica specifically. Okay. Um, I've done all of my grad, grad research there, um, but our research group looks at agroforestry systems in West Africa. Um, we also had a site at, in Guelph. There was a research site in Guelph. Um, another colleague of mine, she's studying specifically riparian buffers that I mentioned, and those riparian buffers can be a type of agroforestry system as well. Um, I'm also going to be going to the World Congress on Agroforestry in Europe this year. And so I'm going to be able to tour a whole bunch of different types of agroforestry farms throughout, throughout Europe. And we're having researchers coming from around the world. So 
India, Australia, North and South America, like everywhere, you're able to practice agroforestry. And what's what I love about uh, agroecology in general, so not just agroforestry, is that it's very specific to where you are. So the agroforestry uh, systems that you'll see in Guelph, Ontario, are very different from what you'll see in Costa Rica, which is very different from what you'll see uh, in a town in India. So uh, it's very specific to where you are. And in that way, uh, it's able to best serve your needs, your farm needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one last question for you, just one that just popped up. Uh, are there any agroecology agri related apps that are worth mentioning specifically in relation to small farming um, settings or crop plantations? So apps? Yes. Um, I don't know of any myself. Um, I would love to, to learn more if, if somebody does know about any agroecology apps. Um, I feel like it's maybe more of a knowledge sharing um, type of need at the moment, or um, if there are apps, maybe it's not just specific to agroecology. It might be um, more like pest identification or um, plant identification type of things that farmers could use. Mm -hmm. But in terms of specifically agroecology apps, I don't know, and I'm unfortunately not tech savvy enough to know how to develop one. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, do you, can you maybe recommend or share um, any resources or websites that are related to agroecology? Yeah, so um, I, I'm assuming you can still see my screen. Yes. Um, these are just a few organizations that I know of and that um, have been shared with me where they either talk about agroecology or even just local food um, organizations. Um, I have listed La Via Campesina, which um, is actually a global uh, food movement, but they do have um, a presence in Canada. Uh, National Farmers Union is Canadian. So these are all different resources where you can learn more you could, um, some of them have workshops even, or even just groups. Um, and it seems to be targeting farmers, of course, but even youth to join the conversation. Um, and I feel like there will be loads of resources there for educators as well. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. So I think we've asked you enough questions for today. <laughs> Um, I just want to once again thank you for sharing your knowledge with us um, and thank you for everybody who listened in.